Welcome back everybody. Let's continue to talk about probability. Now we're going to focus on chapter 6, section 2. So we're talking about section 6.2. And specifically, right now we're going to talk about some basics of probability. The last time that we spoke, we discovered that inferential statistics are really based on computing probabilities. In this particular section, we're going to talk about different perspectives on probability. We're just going to really get the basics down. There's a theoretical perspective, a relative frequency perspective, and a subjective perspective. And what these focus on are just different ways to look at and compute probability. Also toward the end, we'll discuss three different rules of probability, two of which come from section 6.5. So we don't really need to cover section 6.5 because what I want to cover from that section we'll cover right now. All right, let's jump right in. First, let's make sure we understand the range of probabilities. Whenever we're speaking about probabilities, they range between 0 and 1, with those values 0 and 1 included. People often talk about probabilities in terms of percentages. So if the probability is 0.5, someone might say there's a 50% chance. And that makes sense. I just want to make sure that we understand when we're talking about probabilities and when we compute probabilities, the value will always be between 0 and 1, even if we do decide to express it as a percentage. So let's go through a couple examples of what's going on. And when we're talking about probability, we're just talking about a way to help quantify uncertainty. So let me give you an example. Think about the sun rising. Well, someone might say the probability that the sun will rise tomorrow is 0.5, because it's either going to rise or it's not going to rise. And that's really a vast oversimplification of probability. If you think about it, we have a lot of past evidence on suns rising. And of course, I know that the sun doesn't actually rise, but let's just view it that way. Every morning when we get up over the past however many years, the sun has always been there to greet us. So it would be an oversimplification to think that there are two outcomes that are equally likely. In reality, the probability that the sun will rise tomorrow is, is nearly certain. Let's think about another example. Another example would involve flipping a quarter. And there are two different possibilities. It can turn out to be a head or it can turn out to be a tail. And um, once we flip it, essentially the odds are equal of either event occurring, heads or tails. So that would be a, a good example of the probability being 0.5. Let's, let's look at one more just to get a sense here of probabilities. What would be the probability that the Cleveland Browns will win the Super Bowl this year? Well, that's, that's essentially impossible. The probability would, would be zero. It's simply not going to happen. As a longtime Cleveland Browns fan and person from Cleveland, trust me, I know. Let's, let's put some words to these examples. When we were talking about the Cleveland Browns, it was essentially my opinion. It was my opinion based on some experience, some intuition. That's what we call a subjective probability. There's, there are no computations involved. It's really just opinion-based. It's an estimate. When we were talking about the sun coming up, and I was telling you that, I, that we were looking back on past data, we're talking about relative frequencies. I can actually look back at past observations and figure out the probability of some event happening based on how it occurred over the long run. And then when we're looking at that quarter flip, we're, we're really talking about here is a theoretical probability because I'm assuming the outcomes, a head or a tail, are equally likely. So it's not like I really need to flip a quarter a thousand times and, and keep track of how many times it comes up heads or tails to figure out the probability of it coming up a head or a tail. Because I know that each outcome, a head or a tail, is equally likely. So that's, that's based on my theoretical assumptions of that particular coin. All right, well, let's talk about each one of these different perspectives for probability, the relative frequency perspective, the theoretical probability perspective, and the subjective probability perspective. Let's talk about each in a little bit more detail. And we'll begin by talking about subjective probabilities, because there's really not too much to say. These are also known as personal probabilities. And the reason why they're known as personal probabilities is because it's based on your personal judgment. And for example, you know, I'm, I might come up to a strange dog and I might assess in my own mind just by its face and how it's wagging its tail. What's the probability that it's going to bite me? Do I really want to pet it? We are constantly engaging in these types of probability assessments. 
Here are just a couple examples of some good assessments and bad assessments of probability. These are some interesting quotes. Here's one quote. There's a world market for maybe five computers. And obviously, we know that that didn't work out to be true. This person was essentially saying the probability is very low that our company will sell computers. It's kind of interesting to learn that this came from Thomas Watson, who at the time was the chairman of IBM. So he did not do a good job of assessing the probability of selling computers. Now contrast that personal probability with this quote. The most compelling reason for most people to buy a computer for the home will be to link it to a nationwide communications network. We're just in the beginning stages of what will be a truly remarkable breakthrough for most people, as remarkable as a telephone. And when we're talking about this, this communications network, he, he's essentially talking about the internet. This probability estimate was essentially saying that the probability is high that our company will sell computers. This is something that people will want. That was Steve Jobs, who at that time in 1985 was the chairman of Apple. There's really not too much more to say about subjective probabilities. It's simply based on our intuition, based on our experience. It is an estimate of probability. Let's talk about something a little bit more interesting. Let's talk about probabilities from the relative frequency perspective. Here we're talking about computing probabilities empirically, which means based on observation. So based on measurements, observations from the past. And essentially, it comes out this way in terms of computation. Computation is easy. First, we want to you know, repeat and observe some process many times and get a count for the number of times that some event has happened. And when we look at these formulas, we're, we're usually talking about what's the probability of some event A happening. You know, we need to stick some letter in there or something so we can kind of figure out what we're talking about. So I might be trying to figure out what's the probability that some event, like a heads, when I flip a quarter, will happen. So when we're talking about event A, it's just generically talking about some event. So in order to estimate the probability of some event happening, we're going to want to look to see the number of times that that event happened over the total number of observations. So for example, if I wanted to figure out the probability of flipping a coin and having it turn out to be a heads, I would flip that coin several times under this perspective, figure out how many times heads occurred over the total number of observations, the total number of times that I flipped the coin. So let's go through a couple examples so you'll see what I'm talking about. Geological records indicate that a river has crested above a particular flood level four times in the past 2,000 years. What is the probability that the river will reach this flood level next year? Well, let's walk through the steps again. In order to estimate the probability of some type of flood, we want to look over the long run, and we have that information. We know that it's happened four times over the past 2,000 years. So it's, it's relatively unlikely. It doesn't happen very often. Now to estimate the probability of there being a flood in any given year, we're going to set up that basic equation. We're going to look and see the number of times that the event happened. And remember, this has happened four times over the long run, over the total number of observations. They've observed this particular river over the past 2,000 years, you know, going back with um, geological records, not necessarily written records. So again, four times over 2,000. I mean, it's really that simple. And at this point, we can kind of reduce that to 1 over 500, and we can pull out our calculator real quickly. To um, do the basic math, we would have 1 divided by 500, and that would equal 0 .002, 0 .002. So remember how this works, too. 0.2 would be 2 times out of 10. 0.02 would be 2 times out of 100. 0 0.002 is 2 times out of 1,000. So we would only expect to find this about 0 0.002 um, times. And when we're looking at that per 1,000, that's about 2 times per 1,000. So the probability of having a flood of this magnitude in any given year, about 1 out of 500, or 0 0.002. So you see how we can, we can quantify this based on past data. That's what the relative frequency perspective of probability is all about. So what's the probability that there will be a flood next year? All things being equal, very low. Well, let's again look at this relative frequency perspective, and let's go through an example where we're talking about flipping a coin. So what's the probability of 
flipping a coin and having it be a heads. And again, we would want to measure and observe the coin tosses and then count the number of times that the coin lands heads. Then we can estimate the probability that it will come up heads. So let's say I flip a coin and it turns out to be heads. And then I flip that coin again and it's tails. And I, and I do this over the long run. So I keep flipping that coin, flipping the coin, flipping the coin, flipping the coin. So we're only going to do it here several times, but in order to get a good estimate of the probability of it coming up heads, we would need to make sure we give it a, a fair shot. You know, like we, we flip that coin lots of times, you know, like hundreds of times would probably be a good idea. So, all right, now we've got some data that we can look at. That's what the relative frequency perspective of probability relies on. So now let's compute the probability of flipping a coin and having it turn out heads we would need to look at the number of times that this event happened. So how many times do we see a head? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have eight heads over, looks like two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 tosses. So there were eight heads uh, over 16 different occurrences altogether, the total number of occurrences, which of course equals 0.5. So I made up this example so that it would work out really well. But I also use this example to to kind of raise the next type of probability that we're going to talk about because th there's got to be a better method for computing the probability of a coin landing heads than actually having to flip that coin a couple hundred times. And this is where I'm going to introduce you to that theoretical perspective. Of course, I, I could, of course, use the relative frequency perspective, and we can go ahead and track it based on empirical observations, actually observing what's going on. But there's another way to do this, and that's because we can make some basic assumptions about this coin. And the basic assumptions that we can make about its properties are that it's, it's equally likely to land as a head or a tail. The coin is made in a way that it's it's equally weighted so that there's no bias in that respect. Well, let's begin talking about the theoretical perspective using a slightly different example. Let's, let's talk about some cards first, and I'll introduce some terms along the way. First of all, when we're talking about outcomes, we're essentially just talking about the basic results of our observations. So if we're dealing with cards, think about a deck of cards. A deck of cards will have you know, four different suits, here we have just one suit represented, the spades, but you know that there are clubs and hearts and diamonds. And then in each one of those suits, there are all these different cards. There's an ace, we go two through 10. Then there are face cards, jack, queen, king. So we have like, I guess I think 13 or so different cards there. So the bottom line is I know something about the properties of a deck of cards. I know that there are 52 cards, I know that there are 13 cards in each suit and that there are four suits. Well, the events, when we're talking about events, they're just groups of outcomes that share some type of property. So an event in this case might be the card suit. You know, the, all of these cards obviously share some property. They're all spades. So that's just so that you understand a couple terms that come up in terms of outcomes and events. So let's say I'm trying to figure out now what's the probability of randomly selecting a card and having it turn out to be a spade. Well, the theoretical perspective of probability will allow me to figure that out without actually making observations. We're not gonna have to take a deck of cards and then randomly select a card a couple hundred times just to try to figure out the probability, what proportion of times does it come out spades. Just using the basic assumptions that we already talked about, understanding the, the properties of this deck, we should be able to figure out the probability. So for example, the process of selecting a card results in all cards being equally likely to be selected because we're going to shuffle it up and no card is going to have an edge over another. So we're going to be able to use that information to figure out a couple probabilities. Let's do that next. Let's revisit the coin example because that's going to give us a, a simple way to get into it. Then we'll go through a couple card examples. So what we need to do, of course, to, to figure out a probability is count, in this case, the number of all possible outcomes. That, that's why I wanted to look at this coin example first before we looked again at cards, because there are lots of different outcomes for cards. But when it comes to a coin, there are really just two possible outcomes, heads or tails. So 
The next step that we need to think about when we want to compute something based on this theoretical perspective is look to see among all those possible outcomes, what are the ways in which that event that we're interested in can occur? And we, we were interested in figuring out um, how often or what the probability is that a coin would come up heads. And in this case, there, there should just be one way in which that can come up. Then we can estimate the probability of, of flipping a coin and having it turn out heads. All right, so again, just kind of walking through it, we would look at the possible outcomes for the coin toss. Something can come out heads or it can come out tails. We're trying to figure out what are the different ways in which it can come out heads. Well, in reality, there's, there's just that one way. It's just going to come out heads or tails. So that means there's only one way it could come out heads. So now again, to, to fit it into our equation, to figure out the probability of flipping a coin and it coming out heads, we look at the number of ways that heads can occur. There's just this one way over the total number of outcomes. There are two total outcomes. So you see this is a slightly different way of looking at things from the relative frequency perspective because we are setting up this equation based on understanding the properties of this coin. We know that it can come up one way and we know that there are two possible ways that it can result, head or a tail. And we know that it's equally likely that it would come up one way or the other. So then we can finally set up our equation. We know that there's one way that the head can come up out of two possible outcomes, head or tails. So just like we thought, the probability of flipping a coin and having it come up heads is 0.50. Well, you can see that this method of computing probability fits this particular example much better than the relative frequency method where we would have to flip the coin many times over. Well, now that we have a, a good sense of how this works, let's go through an example using the cards. We understand their properties and now we can answer some questions about probabilities. And because the cards have so many different ways that they can come up, the probabilities that we compute are a little bit more interesting. It's a little bit more challenging. So let's remind ourselves of all the different cards that are possible. And of course, we know there are four suits altogether. We just have one suit represented right here, the spades. Let's say I want to figure out what's the probability of randomly selecting a spade from a full deck. Well, remember, the first thing we need to do is figure out the possible outcomes for randomly selecting cards. What are all the possible outcomes? Well, here are all the possible outcomes, at least for one suit. There are 13 different cards, four different suits, so we know there are 52 different outcomes. Then we want to figure out how many ways can spades occur? And literally, they're listed right here. We see 13 different ways in which we can get a spade. Well, now we know how we can set up our equation for figuring out the probability of randomly selecting a spade. We know that there are 13 different ways that that event can happen, but that there are 52 different outcomes overall. So in this case, 13 divided by 52 is going to equal 0.25. So we know there's a 25% chance that if we randomly select a card, from a stack of cards that it will be a spade. Let's figure out something from another example. Another couple examples here. And again, we're just looking at cards and we understand their basic properties. And if we understand their basic properties, we can make some theoretical assumptions and compute a theoretical probability. So let's figure out what's the probability of randomly selecting a king from a full deck of cards. So again, we have to always look at this the same way. We have to figure out how many different ways are there that that event can happen. Well, we know that every suit has a king, right? So if the spades have a king, then the other suits, the other three suits have a king as well. So that there are four kings. And then again, if we're randomly selecting a card, we have to figure out the total number of all outcomes. There are 52 different outcomes possible. So now we're dealing with four kings relative to 52 possible outcomes. And let's compute that real quickly open up our calculator, clear it out. We'll take 4, divide by 52, that equals 0 0.076 or approximately 0 0.08. So the probability of randomly selecting a king, 0.08. It's going to happen about 8% of the time. What about the probability of randomly selecting a card from a full deck and finding a face card? And although sometimes people include aces, like when people are playing poker, sometimes they refer to that as a, as a face card. Let's just literally think about the cards that have faces. There are three cards that have faces for any particular suit. We know that there are four different suits. 
So three times four would be 12 different face cards overall. So that's the number of ways that a face card can occur. Total number of all outcomes, there are 52 different cards. So they're all equally likely. So we're looking at 12 possible ways that a face card can occur relative to 52 different cards that could possibly be selected. So 12 divided by 52, let's figure that out real quickly. 12 divided by 52 equals 0.23. So here we're talking about 0.23 would be the probability or about 23% of the time we would expect to randomly select a face card. Let's look at one more. What's the probability of randomly selecting an ace after you've already received an ace? And just to keep things simple here, let's say that you are being dealt the cards one right after another. In the real world, when we're computing probabilities for cards, like you might have seen this on TV, it can be very complex. And if you're actually playing cards, those probabilities can be essentially impossible to compute because you don't know what the other player has. You, know, you, you of course, can make decisions based on possibilities, um, but the way that, that people are able to compute probabilities when you're watching people playing cards on TV is because the cameras can see the cards that everybody has. So let's keep this simple here. What's the probability of randomly selecting an ace out of that deck after already receiving an ace? Well, we know that there are four different suits, so that there are four different aces. You already have one ace, so how many aces are left? There are three. There are three aces left, and now we want to look at the total number of all outcomes. Well, there are no longer 52 cards remaining, but 51. So after you've received an ace, what's the probability that you're going to get another ace? There are three ways that it can occur, and 52 outcomes overall in terms of the number of cards that are left. So we have three possibilities out of 51. So the probability in this case would be, let's clear out our calculator, three divided by 51, which equals 0.058. We can round that to about 0.06. So that's gonna happen about 6% of the time. Now, let me show you another way that we can take these theoretical probabilities to another level. And we want to do that because we can often compute theoretical probabilities and, and they give us a lot of information. So let's just go through a quick example where you'll see my point. What's the probability of tossing two coins and finding two heads? So I've got one coin, I toss it. I've got another coin, I toss it. What's the probability that they both come up heads? Well, let's think about it for a second. For the first coin, there are two possible outcomes, right? It's going to come up heads or it's going to come up tails. And then for that second coin, again, there are two possible outcomes. It's going to come up heads or it's going to come up tails. Now, here's another really important point. The results of the first toss are completely independent of the second toss. It's not like those coins are talking to each other. It's not like there's some type of memory collective between those coins. It does not matter if the first coin comes up heads or tails. That has no bearing on what happens with the second coin coming up heads or tails. Well, if that's the case, if these coin tosses are independent, that's what it means, if they're independent, then we can compute the total number of outcomes by multiplying the individual outcomes. So for the first coin, heads or tails can come up. There are two possible outcomes. For the second coin, heads or tails could come up, two possible outcomes. So how many outcomes are there altogether? Two times two equals four. Let me show you what I mean. So for that first coin, it can come up heads or it can come up tails. Now remember, once we flip that second coin, we might have a head followed by another head. We might have a head followed by another tail. I'm sorry, a head followed by a tail. That first coin could have come up tails. That could have been followed by a head, but that tail could have been followed by another tail. So we can see all the different outcomes. We could have had head, then head, head, then tails, tails, then head, or tail, then tail. Those are all the different outcomes that could have come up. Now, just using the terminology that we've used before, that's four different outcomes, but it's really just three events. Here we had all heads, here we had all tails, and these two really are the same event. It's where we have one head and one tail, but that's, that's not so important for right now. We're trying to figure out what's the probability of flipping a coin and having it come out heads then flipping another coin and having it come out with a head. So we want to look at the number of ways that this could actually occur 
And in this case, we can see that it can only occur one way, a head followed by a head, over the total number of all outcomes. And we can see that there are one, two, three, four outcomes. And remember, we were able to compute that pretty easily just by taking these two outcomes and multiplying by these two outcomes, two times two. Because you can see this can get to be a pain to have to set up a table like this to figure out all the outcomes. We want to find a simple method. If the two coin tosses are independent, we can figure out all the possible outcomes by multiplying their individual outcomes. So here we've got one divided by four, which of course equals 0.25. So when you flip coins, you will find heads followed by heads about 25% of the time. Let's go through a somewhat more challenging example, but we'll be using the information we just learned. So it should be pretty easy. In fact, it'll be exactly like this, just with a different scenario. So what's the probability of rolling snake eyes uh, when two fair dice are thrown? So they're equally weighted. That's what I mean by fair. Well, let's think it out. When I roll that first die, there are six possible outcomes because this is a six-sided cube and there are dots representing numbers one through six. That second die, when I throw it, again, there are, there are six different outcomes. It's a six-sided dice or die and um, the dots represent six different numbers. Now, just like with the quarters, each roll of the die, of the dice, sorry, that whole issue confuses me of singular or plural with dice, but as I roll them, they're completely independent. It's not like one of these dies has a memory. So if it comes up one, the second one's gonna be less likely to come up because it doesn't wanna follow the other. It, it's completely independent. So remember, we learned if they're completely independent, we can figure out the probability of rolling one and finding a one, rolling another one, finding a one, that would be snake eyes. We can figure out that probability by first figuring out the total number of outcomes. If there are six ways in which the first one can come up and there are six ways in which the second one can come up, we can multiply those to find 36 different outcomes. Now we could chart that out, but we don't need to and it would be quite a pain to do so. So we learned a nice little trick. So what is the probability of rolling snake eyes, which means a one followed by a one? Well, we look at the number of ways that it can occur. Well, it can only occur one way. That's when both the die come up with a one on it. Out of how many total outcomes? We've learned that there are 36 different ways that those dice can come up. So one divided by 36. Let's compute that real quickly. We would have 1 divided by 36 equals 0.027, and we'll round that to about 0.023. Point, uh, I'm sorry, to 0.03. So it's not, it's not going to happen very often. We would expect to roll snake eyes only about 3% of the time. Let's go through another example where we'll use the same techniques that we've been learning. What's the probability of picking the winning three-digit number straight in Ohio Lottery's pick three numbers game. And what that means is when you win straight is you need to pick three numbers. These are numbers zero to nine. And then put together, it makes a three digit number like one, seven, six. And to win straight, you need to pick the numbers in order. One, seven, six will win, but one, six, seven would not win. So hopefully you've got a sense of what I'm talking about. Well, let's walk through it again. So the first ball that comes up, because this is how it works, there are these big bins of balls. I'm sure you've seen this before. And in the pick three numbers game, there are three bins of balls, and each bin has the little balls that are numbered zero to nine. So there are 10 different balls. That means there are 10 different outcomes. The second bin of balls is completely independent, right? It, it has The ball that comes up in the second bin has no bearing on whether there was a one that came up from the first bin or a seven that came up from the first bin. So we're seeing, we're gonna be able to compute the total number of all outcomes using our little trick because that third ball is in a separate bin and it's completely independent as well. And we know that there are 10 outcomes there. The balls range from zero to nine. So there are 10 different balls. As I mentioned, the bins are independent. So the total number of all outcomes can be computed by computing the number of outcomes multiplied by the number of outcomes multiplied by the number of outcomes in each bin. So 10 times 10 times 10 gives us 1,000 different outcomes.
But now let's just think about this again in another way. It'll help you make sense of this. Think about a three digit number like one, seven, six. How many, digit, how many three digit numbers exist in the world? The lowest one possible would be zero, zero, zero. The highest one possible would be nine, nine, nine. How many numbers are there between zero, zero, zero and nine, nine, nine? There'd be a thousand. So you, you can see that this works. 10 times 10 times 10 will really give us the 1,000 potential outcomes, but in an easy way. All right, let's figure out what's the probability of winning the pick three numbers game. So the number of ways in which winning can occur, it's only going to occur one way, right? They're going to pick one three-digit number, something like 176. You can only win if you have that number, 176. So there is one way of winning over the total number of outcomes. Well, there are 1,000 different combinations of numbers that can come up. So one out of 1,000, of course, is going to equal 0 .001. Remember, this would be like one tenth, one one hundredth. Here's one one thousandth, one time in a thousand. So here's some interesting information. Over the long run, you know, playing your number, you'd expect to win about one out of every one thousand plays, you know, like over the long run on average. And you'd invest about a thousand dollars, you know, after playing a thousand times. It's a buck a shot. Now, unfortunately, the winning number will only pay you five hundred dollars. So you can see these lotteries are really a sucker's game, but I know people aren't necessarily p playing because it's a smart financial decision. I play sometimes too, it's just kind of fun. Um, so we won't put any judgments on anybody. Let's go through another example, very similar. What's the probability of picking the winning three digit number, but now let's say boxed for Ohio's pick three numbers game. And what it means when we play boxed is that if you pick for example, the three-digit number 176 boxed, it could actually be a winner for you regardless of which way those numbers come up. 176, 167, and all the other possible combinations. So again, we need to figure out how many outcomes there are overall. We know that there are 10 balls in the first bin, 10 balls in the second bin, and 10 balls in that third bin. We also know that those bins are independent, so the total number of outcomes overall would be a thousand. But here's where things get just a little bit interesting. If we're playing boxed, the number of ways that you can win is going to be more than one. So let's just think it out for a second. I, I wrote out separately here all the different ways that a winning number could come up. We were using the example 176. So it could come up 176, it could come up 167. It could come up 716, it could come up 761, or 617, or 671. Those are all the different ways that it could come up. And if you were in front of me, if we were in class, we would generate those ways and you'd be able to do it just as easily as I could. I'm just looking at all the different combinations. And if you count those up, there will be six different combinations. So if we're going to figure out the probability of winning boxed, you would have six different ways you can win out of 1,000 different numbers that could potentially come up. So six divided by 1,000 is gonna equal six thousandths. Well, here again is some interesting information. Over the long run, you'd expect to win one out of every 100, 600, uh, I'm sorry, one out of every 167 plays, and you'd invest about $167. But now again, unfortunately, the winning number only pays about half that, which is $83. So it's, it's a sucker's game. You know, the probability is not with you to win over the long run. And when you do win, you're not going to recoup your costs over the long run. Um, but, you know, some people find it fun. All right, let's make sure that we can distinguish between subjective probabilities, relative probabilities, and theoretical probabilities. Here are a couple examples. Based on government death records, the probability of dying in a car crash is one in 7,000, and we're talking about per year. So what kind of probability would that be? There we're talking about a relative probability because we're talking about based on death records. We're actually looking at the death records and we're figuring out how many people are dying in car crashes per year. So we can essentially figure out for the population the probability of dying in a car crash by looking at the relative frequencies, the past data. So the key thing is we're looking at records. We're actually looking at data.
What's the probability that you'll get married? Or let's say you say to yourself, the probability that you'll get married this year is zero. Well, that's not something we can look at over the long run, right? Like, you know, over the past 25 years that you've been in exactly the same type of situation, what proportion of the times have you gotten married? That would be computing a relative frequency. All this really is is a guess, right? An estimate of the probability. You know, and you know yourself, you know your situation, so it's not like the guess is based on nothing, but it's still just an estimate or a guess of the probability. So that, of course, would be a subjective probability or a personal probability, as they're sometimes known. Let's look at another example. The probability of rolling a seven with a 12-sided die is one out of 12. Well, we just went through several examples like that. We know that we don't need to roll the die in order to figure out relative frequencies. Just based on understanding the properties of that die, knowing that there are 12 different sides, we can figure out the probability theoretically. So that would be a theoretical probability. All right, let's finish up by talking about these different rules of probability. There are basic rules. We're just going to talk about three. I'll try to go through them relatively quickly. I know there's a lot in this chapter and in this section specifically, but we just want to make sure that um, it's all covered. So I'm sorry that this video is going to be a little bit longer than normal. Let's look at rule, num rule number one. This is saying that the probability of some event plus the probability of that event's complement, and that's what this little bar on the top of it represents, equals one. So the probability of some event plus the probability of some event's complement equals one. What does it mean that the event's complement? Essentially, it means everything other than that event. You'll see what I mean when we go through this example. This is a very simple rule. So if the probability of a spade equals 0.25, then the probability of its complement must equal something that when added together will equal one. Well, what is a, the complement of finding a spade? It's finding anything other than a spade. So the probability of finding a heart, a diamond, or a club. And I'm saying that the probability of finding a spade plus the probability of finding a heart, diamond, or club must equal one. Well, that must mean then the probability of finding a heart, diamond, or club equals 0.75. Because I know, th I know that these two events together probability of finding a spade and then the probability of finding the spade's complement must add up to one. All right, so that was probably too much talking. It's, it was probably more straightforward than, than was necessary for me to discuss. So let's just look at the next example. Probability of snake eyes. If the probability of snake eyes equals 0.03, then what's the probability of not getting snake eyes? Well, 0.97. You know, they, they need to equal one. And that's because 100% of the time, you need to roll either snake eyes or something else. Last example, probability of winning the pick three numbers game. We know that that equals 0 0.001. So what's the probability of losing? It's pretty high, 0.999. So the probability is almost certain on any given attempt that you're going to lose. But of course, over the long run, you'd expect to win about one out of every thousand times. So you can see rule number one. The probability of some event plus its complement must add up to 1 or 100%. Let's look at rule 2. If two events are mutually exclusive or non-overlapping, and what that means is they can't occur simultaneously, then the probability of some event A or some event B will be equal to taking the probability of event A and then just simply adding the probability of event B. You know, these things usually are more complicated when you, you read out the actual rule. And then you'll see it's pretty simple once we go through some examples. Let's talk about mutually exclusive or non-overlapping events just to make sure you know what they mean. And again, it means that the events cannot occur simultaneously. So for example, a coin toss, it's going to come up heads or it's going to come up tails. Once it's heads, it's not tails. They can't occur simultaneously. Class grades are mutually exclusive. I'm going to give you an A or I'm going to give you a B for your final grade. Once I give you an A, I'm not giving you a B. So grades are mutually exclusive. Cause of death is a good example. From what I understand, when it comes to death records, there is a cause of death, death listed. So if it says something like traumatic head tra uh, injury, that's the cause of death and it's not something like a heart attack one cause of death is listed. That's my understanding of it, at least. And if that was the case, then cause of death would be mutually exclusive. 
So with that information, let's, let's just go through a quick example or two. Let's say that this represents the probability of earning a grade A, B, C, D, or F in our class. And I'm not sure if these really equal out to our true distribution or not. I just don't recall. But let's just use that as an example. So based on those individual probabilities, what's the probability of earning an A or a B? Well, because we know that these grades are mutually exclusive, we know that we can add the individual probabilities to find the probability of one or the other occurring. So here we see the probability of earning an A is 0.15. The probability of earning a B, 0.30. Add those together, you get 0.45. So there's nearly a 50% chance of earning an A or a B. Let's figure out the probability of earning a C, D, or an F. Well, we could add up those individual probabilities. 0.35 plus 0.15 plus 0.05. So that would be, let's see, 0.35 plus 0.15 is 0.5 plus a 0.05 would be equal to 0.55. Now, some of you might have seen that we could compute this after we knew this value because of rule one. Because rule one says that the probability of this event, getting an A or a B, plus the probability of its complement, which would be getting some other grade, must add up to one. 0.45 plus 0.55 does add up to 1. Let's go through one more rule. And actually, I guess before we go through that rule, let's go through a couple examples with um, rolling die again in, in rule 2. Suppose you roll a single die. What's the probability of rolling an even number? We can compute that. So the potential outcomes would be a 2, a 4, or a 6 when we're talking about a die. And we know that they're all mutually exclusive because once you roll that die and it rolls a four, it's not going to be a six or a two because, of course, the die is only going to produce one result. So if it's mutually exclusive, each outcome, we know that we can add up the individual outcomes in order to find the probability of rolling, in this case, an even number, a two, a four, or a six. So the probability of rolling a 2 would be 1 out of 6. So at this point, I'm just going to list these as, as fractions. The probability of rolling a 4 would be 1 out of 6, and the probability of rolling a 6 would be 1 out of 6. So these are three of the six potential outcomes. So it's, it's probably no mystery that this is going to turn out to be 3 over 6, which would be 0. 0.5. And one of the reasons why I showed it first as fractions is because, you know, we're going to have to deal with some rounding error. If you take a 1 and you divide it by 6, it's going to be like 1.666 repeating. And if we eventually rounded that to something like 0.17, our final answer is going to be something like you know, 0.51. And you know, we can see that obviously this occurs with a probability of 0.5. So sometimes we're just going to be dealing with a little bit of rounding error. All right, finally, now let's get on to rule number 3. If two events are independent, so we're going to have to learn what that means. And what that means is, they are completely unrelated to each other. And we talked about that a little bit earlier on. When two events are independent, then the joint of occurrence, the probability of A and B happening together, that's what I mean by their joint occurrence, will equal the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B. So if the two events are independent, what's so important is that you realize these rules are based on some condition being true. So we can multiply the individual probabilities to find the probability of their joint occurrence only if those events are independent. Let's go through a couple examples. These examples are pretty well known to us now. So what's the probability of snake eyes? Well, those events are indeed independent because when I roll the one die, it has no bearing on the outcome of the next die. They're completely independent. So if the probability of rolling that first one is 1 out of 6, which equals 0.17, and then, of course, the probability of rolling a 1 again, and again, is 1 out of 6, or 0.17. I can multiply those individual values. And when I multiply those together, I find that it equals 0.03. And that's exactly what we computed previously for the probability of finding snake eyes. And here we're just finding one more way that it can be computed based on rule number 3. What's the probability of finding two heads in a row? Well, remember, each time we flip a coin the outcome is 0.5, that it's going to come out heads or tails. And when I flip a coin, it has no memory. 
So each flip is completely independent of the next. So that means I can figure out the probability of flipping a coin and having it be a heads, and then flipping a coin again and having it be a head. That would be 0.5 times 0.5. That equals 0.25. So we figured that out previously, and we figured that it was exactly that value, 0.25. Now we're just using another method based on rule number three. The more rules we learn, it, it gets easier and easier to compute probabilities because we learn these little tricks. What's the probability of randomly selecting the king of hearts? You know, that, that's something that we computed previously. And because the the card, the actual value of the card, like king or three or ace, the value of the card is completely independent of its suit. Because remember, every suit has a king. It's not like just the hearts have a king. There's a king for the hearts, for the clubs, for the diamonds, for the spades. So the actual value of the card, whether it's a king or a queen or a ten or a four, and its suit are completely independent. And what that means is we can find their joint occurrence. What's the probability of finding the king of hearts? by first finding the probability of randomly selecting a king and then multiplying by the probability of randomly selecting a heart. Well, let's think that out again. How many kings are there? There are four divided by 52 altogether, and we worked that out. That came out to happen about 8% of the time. How many hearts are there? Well, there are 13 different hearts out of 52 different cards overall, and that's 25% or 0.25. So if we multiply the 0.08, which is the probability of finding a king, multiplied by the 0.25, which is the probability of finding a heart, we find the probability of finding the king of hearts equals 0.02. And by the way, that's just one card, right? The king of hearts? Well, one card out of 52 equals about 0.02. So we're able to corroborate this value that we computed based on looking at it a slightly different way. So we feel very confident that we're correct. Let's look at something else that we looked at previously. What's the probability of winning the pick three? Finding the pick three number straight. Again, the, the bins of balls are completely separate, completely independent. So we should be able to use rule three. So what's the probability that the first bin has your winning number? Well, the probability would be 0.1 because remember there are 10 balls. One out of 10 would equal 0.1. You're looking for number one because your three digit number is one, six, seven. Well, the probability of that one coming up is one out of 10. Well, what's the probability that that second ball is gonna be the six you're looking for? Well, again, that's just one ball out of 10. So the probability is 0.1. And what's the probability that that last ball is the ball that you're looking for, that number seven? That's just one ball out of 10. So the individual probabilities are 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and 0 0.1. So how do we figure out their joint occurrence? We take them and we multiply them, and 0.1 times 0 0.1 times 0 0.1 equals 0 0.001. So just like we learned before, it's gonna happen one out of a thousand times. And that makes sense because there are 1,000 numbers between 0, 0, 0, and 9, 9, 9. So the more we can think this out, the more we can make sense of it, the better, the better we're gonna truly understand what's going on. Let's go through a quick example. Suppose you toss three fair coins, so they're nice and equally weighted. What is the probability of getting three tails? Well, because point, uh, coin tosses are independent, we can multiply their individual probabilities. Well, we know that the probability of a tail is 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, in this case would equal 0.13. So it's only gonna happen about 13% of the time. Here's something really quickly, just in closing, looking toward the future. We will be looking at probability distributions. So after counting outcomes and computing probabilities, we could actually create a distribution of all potential outcomes. So we were looking before to see how many times we'd get like two heads, how many times we get two tails, how many times we get like a combination of heads and tails. Well, if I was looking to see, you know, like the proportion of times that I get heads, I could compute and create a probability distributions. So how many times did I find two heads? That occurred one time. One time out of four potential outcomes. So the probability was 0.25. So again, I'm trying to create a probability distribution based on the number of times that heads come up, just to give you an example. Well, what's the time that I get something like one head and one tail? We can see that that happened twice, right? Twice out of four outcomes.
So the probability of that happening is 0.5. Half the time I'm going to find a head and a tail. And how many times do I find no heads? In other words, I flip it twice and I find two tails. That happens once out of each four potential outcomes. So about 25% of the time. So of course when I look at all those probabilities, they add up to one. That makes sense. And then look at this now. I can create a distribution in which I chart the proportion of times that I find no heads, the proportion of times that I find one head, and the proportion of times that I find two heads. I just wanted to show you with, with even this really simple little example. And what do we see here? This is essentially a normal distribution right? centered around this mean of one head. So we will be able to look at these distributions later on and they're going to tell us a lot about um, the probabilities we need to compute. So that's just looking toward the future. All right, my friends, I know that this was a long video, and I know that was, that, that, that was a lot to take in. Just make sure you practice. Look at some of the exercises at the end of the text. If you can go through those and make sense of them, then you're on the right track. If you're having problems with those, just let me know. So that was the key content from Section 6.2. For now, that is all.